And so we'll be in 1 John for just a minute this morning. We won't be spending a lot of time in there, but uh, what I wanted to talk about this morning is just kind of, uh, you know, the Christian life and, and uh, one thing in particular that's important if we're going to live a successful Christian life, a victorious Christian life, uh, a life that is not static or moving backward, because that is the intent of the Christian life. The Christian life is not a life that's meant to be lived standing still, you know, static, just as you know, staying in one place. Uh, and it's certainly not to be a life that's where we are backsliding or moving backward or farther away from the things of God. We're always supposed to be moving closer to Christ, uh, doing greater works than we did before. And that's a great, uh, you know, uh, it's a philosophy that we need to have as individuals and, and even as a church. You know, a church needs to have that attitude and that mindset of we're always trying to do more for Christ. I mean, the fact is, uh, God has laid upon us uh, a very uh, uh, high calling uh, to say, go and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, I was thinking about that, how great that is that God gave us that charge. Some people would look at that charge and say that's overwhelming. And that, that's not to say, to make light of it, that's not to say that that isn't a monumental task to accomplish. But what that does is it keeps us busy, doesn't it? It keeps us always striving to do better, always striving to do more works. Uh, we think about our church in particular, you know, Faithful Word Baptist Church. It'd be really easy for this church to sit back and, and rest on its laurels and say, boy, well, we've done a lot. You know, we could say, what, do we really need to finish knocking the rest of the Navajo Nation? I mean, after all, we've knocked uh, nearly every door on every other reservation in the state of Arizona. We can just take our time getting to that. But here's the thing. We need to knock all those doors, then we need to go knock them again. Amen. And then we need to knock the doors in New Mexico. We need to knock the doors in Colorado. We need to knock the doors in Utah. You know, there's, there's an abundance of work to do, so it only makes sense that the Christian life is one we're always to be moving forward, always trying to level up, uh, you know, our, our Christian life, always trying to do more. It's not static. It's not just hitting a plateau and saying, this is good enough. It's definitely not moving backward. It's a life that's intended to be lived. It's a life of, of upward progress. And really, when you think about it, <clears throat> if we look there in 1 John 3, what we see ultimately is that the perfection, or excuse me, the goal is perfection. That is the goal of the Christian life. I'm not saying we're going to attain that in this life. I'm not saying that we're ever going to reach a, a point in our lives on this earth that we're going to be perfect in every way. In the inward man, the outward man, that, that we're without sin. But if we look here in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 1 it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be. But we know that uh, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Bible says that when Christ comes, we shall be like him. And that's when we reach perfection. That's when we are given that new body in Christ. That's when we have the fullness of the mind of Christ, where, where sin isn't even going to be a thing for us anymore. Praise God. But that's the goal. You know, that's what we should strive for along the way. We should strive to do these things because Scripture tells us if we do these things, we shall never fall. Now are we going to fall? Of course. And elsewhere in 1 John, we could read that great verse in chapter 1. You know, if we sin, uh, you know, uh, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we need to take advantage of that along the way. But let's always remember that the goal is perfection. That's where we're headed. That is the destination. And it says there in verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So we see here in 1 John that that is the, to be as he is, that is the predestin, uh, predetermined destination. That's where we're headed. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of Christ. That's the goal we're aiming for. The measure of the stature of Christ. That's a lofty goal. That's something that you have to really strive to attain for. But you know, it's good to have those type of goals in life. To have big goals. Goals that are going to bring us out of our comfort zone. That are going to motivate us and push us to, to push through and, and, and endure hardship. Because we're trying to reach a very high goal. And we know, you know, we don't want to be discouraged by this fact. But we know that we're not going to reach it. But we're going to try to reach it. We're going to, try, we're going to reach it. Not in this life, we're going to reach it when Christ comes. Then we shall be as, as He is. We're all going to be conformed to the image of the Son of God one day. We might as well just start working on it right now. We might as well just go ahead and start conforming right now. We might as well go ahead and just start reading the things of God, understanding the things of God, and doing the things of God now, because ultimately that's where we're going to end up. 
<clears throat> now, if you would, turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says in Romans 8, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Again, that's the goal. That's the predetermined destination, showing us that the Christian life is not a static one. It's not one where we just let it pass by until we get there. No, we should be striving. We should be trying to attain unto that goal. If the Christian life is likened unto a race, which Paul often li likened it unto, he'd liken it unto a war, he'd liken it unto a race. I, I, if, if the Christian life is a race, if we look at it the way, this being conformed to Christ would be the finish line. Being, uh, coming into the fullness of the stature of Christ, that would be when we reached, when we crossed the ribbon. That would be when our foot comes over that finish line. That would be the end of the race. And if that's the case, if, that, if, 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 reach, if being conformed to the image of his son is the finish line, that would make this life the track, wouldn't it? That would make us uh, running this race uh, uh, until we come to the knowledge of the, son of, uh, the fullness of the stature of Christ. That would make this life that we're living a sort of racetrack. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so here's the thing. If this life is like a race that we're running, like Paul likened it unto in Hebrews 12, we'll see. We must learn to run at the proper pace. We have to... We have, to, we have to run in a such a way as that we're going to finish and finish well. And of course, one of the things we see here in Hebrews 12 is that we must learn to run at the proper pace. You have to pace yourselves. Let me get over to Hebrews 12 with you. What he says there in Hebrews 12 is that we must learn to run with patience. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He said, let us therefore run with patience. You know where the Hebrews 12, if I quit talking, I'd probably find it fa faster. In Hebrews chapter 12, he says, beginning in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay every side the weight and the sin which doth easily so beset, uh, beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So Paul here is saying, look, the life you're living is a race. And here's some things about it that you need to... Uh, he's showing us th uh, some things that we need to practice in our lives and able to run that race well. And one of the things he said is to lay aside every weight. You know, we could talk, we could talk about every one of these points. Every one of them could be a, a sermon in and of itself. Laying away the weight that so easily besets us. And we often think of sin, right? But it says let, laying aside every weight and the sin. Meaning this, that not every weight in your life is necessarily a sin. Some of those things that are holding us back and not allowing us to run the race as we should, those aren't necessarily sinful things. It might just be, you know, I've, I've preached in, 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 in the past, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with is a guilty conscience. A guilty conscience, you know, of, of not uh, uh, realizing that all those things that you've done or been are in the past. That Christ has forgiven you, that God's forgotten about them, He's forgiven us, we might as well just forgive ourselves and lay aside that weight and run the patience that's set before us. And the sin, you know, maybe there is some sin in our life that we need to let go of and get rid of. It's holding us back. It's keeping us from being the Christians we ought to be. They do so easily beset us. And he says, and let us run with what? With patience. You have to pace yourself. You know, we've got a big job to do. We've got the Christian life is, 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 uh, is not always easy. It has its ups and downs. It has its struggles. And sometimes it can be um, very difficult. And, uh, and that's the way it is. But, you know, that's why it's important to pace yourself. And not feel like you have to, uh, you're, you're not necessarily racing everybody else in the Christian life. You know, we don't want to, I think it's good to challenge one another. I think it's good to be inspired by another person's zeal. But we should never, and I'm kind of getting my head itself here, but we should never feel like we have to, we're trying to outrace somebody else. Right. You know, the, you're, you're, you're racing the track. You know, the, you're, you're running at your own pace. The important thing is that you run with patience. But that's really not what I want to focus in here or focus in on here. But, you know, just as important as the pace at which you're running is where you set your gaze. And that's really what I want to talk about this morning is where you're looking while you run. And if you look there in verse 2, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So he says, look, if you're going to run well, you've got to lay aside the weights. You've got to lay aside the sins. He says, if you're going to run well, you have to do it with patience. But there in verse 2, he tells you, you have to look unto Jesus. See, just as important as all these other things is, is where you're looking as you run this race. 
<clears throat> if we're going to reach the end with our arms raised, because, you know, I'm again, getting my health, I'm ahead of myself already a little bit. You know, every illustration falls apart at some point, but we're all going to reach the end of the race. And just some of us, you know, might finish last. You know, some of us might get drug kicking and screaming across the, the, the finish line. <laughs> but if we're going to run this race well, and we're going to cross, you know, like a victor with our arms raised, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have to run with our eyes forward, looking ahead, right? And that's, that's the title of the message this morning, Eyes Forward. Just as important as everything else that's mentioned here in Hebrews 12. Running with patience, laying aside the sins, laying aside the weights is where you're looking. You need to be looking forward. You need to be watching where you're going. And if you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. You need to run with your eyes forward. You see, running with our eyes forward is going to do several things for us to help us run this race and prevent us from making mistakes. <coughs> See, if we run with our eyes forward, several things are going to happen. One, we're not going to be distracted by our surroundings. If we're looking where we're supposed to be looking and running that race and keeping our eyes where they belong, we're not going to get distracted by the things around us. And that's, you know, that's such, a, such an important thing to keep in mind, especially in this day and age. Now, I've been thinking about this lately is, is, is the difference you know, between the time I grew up in and the time kids are growing up in now. There wasn't as nearly as much to distract you <laughs> as a kid when, when, I, when I was a kid as there is today. Uh, you know, they're not to say we, our life didn't have its distractions, but I mean, it's just even as adults now, we're just constantly bombarded all the time by media. I mean, the, the smartphones are a double-edged sword, in my opinion. You can do a lot of great things, and, and it's a very useful tool, but it can also be a, a huge uh, distraction in our lives, can it? It can be a, a major uh, waste of time, <laughs> in fact. And, uh, you know, we need to learn to keep our eyes fixed on where uh, they belong and keep our eyes fixed on where we're headed if we're going to run this race and not get distracted by our surroundings. You know, when they would hook up uh, horses, you know, often, I think I'm getting this right anyway, uh, you know, they'd, they'd put a horse in a carriage, they'd put those blinders on that horse. Why would they put the blinders on there? Because they want that horse to focus on the trail. They don't want him, you know, seeing the radishes over here and going, oh, I'm going to go have a snack. You know, and that's, you know, I, I think I, there, there's a law that's still in the books in some towns, I think, where I came from, that you were not allowed to put radishes and ca or any kind of garden produce along the side of the road because it would distract horses. It was actually, that's <laughs> still on the books. So if you ever want to break the law, you know, just, just put some produce out there in the curb and see if the cops notice. But, uh, but what was the point of that? You know, they didn't want that horse getting distracted. That's why I put those blinders on. And we need to do that to, our, uh, to ourselves, of course, spiritually speaking. You know, don't show up here tonight or uh, there's some of the service we you know with these blinders on. But, you know, <laughs> two, a blinder with just two holes poked in it. You know, spiritually speaking, we need to keep those blinders on. If there, maybe there's something in our life, it's not even necessarily sinful. But we find ourselves just always going, you know, always getting distracted by it. Always getting distracted. You know, just recently I, I, uh, I was reading about this, and, and this is just kind of a small example but uh, I, I was reading about how we're always distracted by, by social media. So I said, I'm going to try something. I got rid of my Facebook app. You know, I got rid of Facebook, and, and I disabled the YouTube. I don't have any social media on my phone. And you know what I found myself doing? Is I'd, I'd be doing something else on my phone, you know, an email. I'd be looking at a, uh, a text message or something. And then just instinctively, I'd gotten so used to doing it, I'd hit the home button, flip it up, and look for Facebook. Without even thinking about it. It was, it was habitual. Maybe that says more about me than anything, but, you know, we, you, I had some issues, right? <laughs> but, I mean, I wonder if maybe some of us, if we did the same thing, we might find our, our, our thumbs just reflexively looking for that social media app, you know, the, the Twittergram or the whatever it is, right? I don't, I'm, I'm the old, I'm old guy in the room, right? So we, the old guys, we only use Facebook, right? Anyway, I had, I think I had Snapchat for like three minutes. <laughs> I got on that and I was like, that's not for me. <laughs> I don't need to be putting puppy barriers or anything like that. <laughs> you know, no filter, right? So anyway. But the point being, you know, sometimes we need to we need to put the blinders on spiritually, not just, you know, in the realm of social media, but maybe there's just something in our life, there's a relationship, there's a circumstance, there's just something in our life that keeps getting us distracted from running the race. We're always looking. We're not watching where our feet are falling. We're not looking at the track ahead of us. You know, Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus said, if you're going to plow, if you're going to work for me, if you're going to put your hand to the plow, you need to keep your eyes forward. You need to be looking ahead. Because what happens, and I know I've used this illustration in the past, is if you start to plow and you're looking back, your furrows end up all over the place. It's inefficient. Are you still going to be able to make a furrow? Yeah. But your corn row is going to look like this. right? It's not going to be that nice, straight lines. You're, you're not going to make the best use of the land that you have. It's going to be inefficient. So we need to learn to not get distracted, to keep our eyes forward. Look there in Proverbs chapter 4. We'll look at verse 25 where it says, uh, <coughs> let's back up to verse uh, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and thine eyelids, eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. So notice here in this passage, the first thing, when you, before he even gets to where the, uh, how the eyes are to be uh, you know, looking right on, and thine eyelids looking straight before, notice that he deals, first of all, with protecting your heart. Because these things are interlinked. These things are, uh, one affects the other. Your eyes will affect your heart and your heart will affect where, you're, where, you're, where you look. It says in Lamentations, I'll read to you, mine eye affecteth mine heart. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. You know, the things that we look at affect our hearts. And, you know, in the, in, in the same way, our hearts will affect our eyes. That's why Jesus said, set your affections upon things which are above, not things upon the earth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where we put our hearts is really going to determine where we're looking in life, isn't it? If we're striving to live for Christ, if we're striving to run this race, then you know what? We're going to stay focused. We're going to keep our eyes in the Word of God. You know, we're going to get our face out of Facebook and get our face in God's book. And we're going to uh, get serious about the things of Christ and we're going to continue to look forward and, and, and uh, live the Christian life like we ought to because what you look at affects your gaze. And what you desire also affects your gaze as well. So go ahead and turn over to, uh, keep something there in Proverbs. We're going to come back to that. Keep something there in Proverbs. But if you would, turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. You see, running with your, what are we talking about this morning? Running the race of, of the Christian life. And there's a lot of different elements that are involved here. But one of the most important is where you're looking. Are you keeping your eyes forward? Philippians chapter 3. Go ahead and just keep something there. So, you know, first of all, running with your eyes forward is going to keep you from being distracted by your surroundings. And, and uh, uh, you know, running with your eyes forward will mean you're not distracted by your past. You know, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I think this is something that, that people struggle with, especially those that have gotten saved later on in life. Uh, you know, we've already, we've already had maybe made some mistakes or we've, we've we haven't le uh, lived, a, a maybe we've got just some things in our past. You know, if we let those things weigh us down. Why? Because we're always looking back at them. We're always looking to the past. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse uh, 13. Paul said, Brethren, I count myself to have apprehended. Now what is he saying there? He said, look, I'm, I'm not claiming to have finished this race. I haven't apprehended. I haven't arrived. Paul knew that. But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So he's saying here, look, I'm not looking back. I'm not looking back on what could have been or what might have been or what has been. He's saying, I'm looking forward. You know, that's how I'm going to press toward the mark is with my eyes forward. You know, a great illustration of this that I heard years ago, you know, if you're going to press toward the mark, you know, you have to put some effort into it. And if, you know, don't try this, if you were to come up behind me after church and just shove me, you could probably knock me over. You know, the, you could pick out some, you know, some young girl could probably do it. You know, if she got enough momentum behind her and blindsided me, she might be able to knock me around on the ground. And, you know, I'm a pretty big guy. And, uh, but here's the thing, you know, uh, <coughs> if I were down in a three-point stance, you know, like a, like a lineman in football, I would get down, but I know that I'd be able to get back out of it <laughs> and show you, right? <laughs> If I were to do that, you know, get down and hunker down and get my hand on the ground, put one leg on my knee and, and brace for impact, I don't care who it is, you're going to have a much harder time knocking me over. In fact, I'm going to have a much easier time of knocking you over. I'm going to be able to press toward the mark if I start out from that kind of a position where I'm focused, where my eyes are forward, where I'm looking at what's ahead of me. 
But if we're just, you know, meandering through life, kind of looking around, and worst of all, if we're not even facing the direction we're supposed to be going, how far do we really expect to make it? So we need to not allow ourselves, we need to keep our eyes forward so that we don't allow ourselves to get distracted. We need to keep our eyes forward so that we can uh, focus on the things that are ahead of us and not the things which are behind us. Forget those things which are behind. You know, those things are over. Those things are gone. You can't change any of that. You know, and it's easy to say that, I understand, but this, and this is something that we have to begin to practice it in our lives and catch ourselves. We need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And if we're beating ourselves up about the past or, you know, or some intrusive thought keeps coming back in, you know, we just need to take that captive for Christ. We need to meditate upon the God, Word of God. Don't, make, don't leave any room for these things to creep back in into your thought life. And uh, <coughs> we keep running the race by looking forward. That's what we need to do, keep our eyes forward. I mean, just imagine the illustration of trying to actually run a race backwards. Now, can you run a race backwards? Yes. In fact, pr somebody's probably even done it, right? If you, if this day and age, it's, it's so odd. Somebody's probably gone ahead and done that. <coughs> but here's the thing. You might even finish the race. You know, and you could run that whole race. It, it's going to take a lot longer. You know, I, I would try to demonstrate, but for, I'm not going to for fear of falling over. <laughs> You know, but here's the thing. Even if you finished, would you take first? Would you take second? Would you place at all? You know, you probably wouldn't. <coughs> and here's the thing. If you try to run a race back by looking backwards and not where you're going, in all likelihood, you're going to stumble and fall. Right. You know, we're all going to stumble and fall. We understand that. None of us is perfect. But let's not do it unnecessarily but because we're too busy looking in the past. Because we're too bad, uh, busy thinking and gazing on things that are behind us. Let's stay focused on the things that are ahead of us so that we don't need to, so we won't stumble unnecessarily. And in fact, you know, if that happens enough, if you run this race of life by always looking back and not looking forward, not keeping your eyes forward, you are going to stumble unnecessarily. And you might stumble so much that you, you give up, that you just quit. And you say, you know what, this is so frustrating, it's not even worth it, I quit. I, I, I can't even finish this race. <coughs> well, here's the thing. Uh, as I said earlier, you're going to finish this race <laughs> one way or another. You know, because remember, what's the end of the race? Being conformed to the image of Christ. When does that happen? When you die. Right? Or when the Lord comes, whichever happens first. But here, so, you know, the, you're, you're going to run this race whether you like it or not. And there really is no quitting. And the Lord will drag you across that finish line kicking and screaming. And you'll get to heaven and we'll take one look at you and say, what in the world happened to you? I ran a race. Well, why are you covered in, in you know, in, uh, in raspberries? You know, you guys that wipe, the guys that wipe out on their bikes and you skin knees and everything, gravel in your face. And what happened? Oh, I quit running. I had to get drugged through life. Is that really how we want to live life? Just getting drugged along till we reach glory? Oh, we want to run the race. We want to look forward. Let's not, let's not look backward because what happens? You look backward, you try to run this race, you're going to fall so many times you might get so discouraged that you try and quit. And then life just becomes even more of a struggle than it needs to be. <coughs> and some people, you know, they, they get into the Christian life, and then I think they, you know, they decide, well, this isn't for me anymore. I'm just going to quit the race. But let me tell you something. The bleachers are off limits. If you got saved, you don't get to go back to the, the unsaved world. You know, we've, we read that in 1 John. You know, we've, uh, we've become his child, you know. Behold what manner of love the Father have, have bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That's a permanent relationship. That never changes. Right. Once you're born again, that's it. You're in the family, whether you like it or not. Right. And now the bleachers at that race, they're not for you. You can't just go back to life just being a spectator. Just looking from the outside in and going, oh, I wonder what the Christian life is about. You're in it now. And if you want to quit, you know, <laughs> you're going to get drug across that finish line one way or another. But one thing's for certain, there's no... You know, you can't, you can't run to the gate and climb out, you know. You can't climb the fence and, 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 quit, the, and quit being a Christian. That's, that fence goes all the way to heaven. You ain't gonna, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna climb over it. <coughs> so, let's keep our eyes forward. Let's not get distracted by the things that are around us. Let's not get distracted by the things that are behind us. Let's keep our eyes forward and let's not get distracted by those things. Let's also not get distracted, if you would, turn back to Proverbs chapter 4. <clears throat> let's not get distracted by other people, whether it's in the church, whether it's outside of the church, whatever it might be. Let's not get distracted by others. It's real easy to get distracted by things, 
That's one thing we get distracted about. It's really in, uh, easy to get distracted by our thoughts, by the, you know, uh, thinking about a past life or the way things could have been or were or should have been. But you know, another thing that distracts people is they get distracted by other people in whatever arena of life it is. Look there in Proverbs chapter 4, uh, verses 25 and 26, where he says, Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids uh, straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. You know, he's saying you should just be concerned with yourself. You should be more concerned about the race you're running, about where your feet are falling, than where somebody else's is. Don't worry so much about others. Now again, keep something in Proverbs. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We don't want to get distracted by other people in, in whatever way they can distract us. Some people allow that to happen. It kind of reminds me of, in, uh, in, uh, you ever play Thumbs Up 7-Up? Who played Thumbs Up 7-Up? Okay, I got a few people. This is going to make sense to a very small portion of the room. Are you guys, are they still playing it in school these days? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, all right. Well, I think um, it's been a while for me, but uh, last I remembered, you had to, uh, everyone would put their heads down on their desk with their eyes closed, and they'd have their thumbs up. You remember this? Yeah. I'm ringing some bells, right? And then the teacher would come by, and they would, she would do that just to one student, right? She would, she would put their thumbs down, and then everyone was allowed to look up, and we had to guess which is this how it goes? Then you have to guess which student yeah. got their thumb down. And then, uh, but whenever that happened, you know, maybe that's not, maybe I got some of the rules wrong. The point is this. When you weren't supposed to be looking, you always have that one kid who would say, so-and-so was peeking. And they would give themselves away. Well, how do you know they're peeking? <laughs> I remember the teacher, I remember this was like a, this was like a light bulb moment for me as a child. Like, how did the, how did the teacher know they were peeking? Uh, the teacher said, well, how do you know he was peeking? I was like, oh, because he was peeking. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, how, else, how do you know where somebody else is looking unless you're busy looking at them? If you yourself are busy peeking, you know, your eyes are supposed to be where they're supposed to be, but you're busy looking around, and then you're going to start tattling on other people. <laughs> oh, he's peeking. He's not looking where he said. She's looking over there. She's not, you know. <coughs> And here's the thing, we, we need to keep our eyes focused on where they belong when it comes to ourselves. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let's go ahead and look there, in uh, verse 12, the Bible says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. I love that. <laughs> we don't compare ourselves with them that commend themselves. People like to commend themselves today, don't they? Especially on social media, and that keeps coming up, right? But this, even, even in our attitudes and, and the way we behave sometimes, we're just commending ourselves. And if you get too distracted by a person like that and you start to compare yourself with somebody who commends themselves, it's really a waste of time. Because who's commending that person that you're comparing yourself to? That person, right? They might be commending themselves. That doesn't necessarily mean they're worthy of those accommodations, right? They're putting a little gold star on their, on their chest saying, look, you and you think, oh, I should get that gold star. I really want to have that gold star too. I wish someone would put that on me. Oh, well, it's real easy. Just go buy one and put it on yourself. That's what that guy did. And that's what she did. It's real easy to do. So let's not compare ourselves, especially unto them that commend themselves. Then he goes on and says, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Don't get distracted in running the Christian life by comparing yourself to everybody around you. Because everybody's at a different pace. Everyone's running at a different pace. Other people are way ahead, uh, much further along in the race. Some people are just starting out. Some people stumbled off the blocks. Some people had a false start. <laughs> all kind of people are in all different places in the race. And so, you know, that's not... I mean, just imagine that an Olympic runner trying to run a race and constantly looking back and making sure you know, see where everybody else is, is placing. You know, where's, where is that, where's so-and-so? Are they in 10th place, 11th place? What place am I in? Always looking around and trying to figure out and compare ourselves to where everybody else is. <coughs> now, if you would, uh, turn over, I should have had you keep something in Hebrews, but if, let's go back to Hebrews real quick. <coughs> Don't compare yourself to others. Don't compare yourselves to those that are in the race with you. It's a distraction. You're looking around, wondering where everybody else is. Keep your eyes where they belong. Keep your eyes forward in the Christian life. 
Look where you're headed. Watch where you're running. The Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 12. So we don't, we don't only want to not get distracted by those around us that are in the race, but let's not get distracted by others that aren't even in the race. Don't even get distracted by those who are just on the sidelines. Because this happens too. The jeering crowd, right? The jeering crowd that's out there that's, that jeered Jesus, that, that mocked him. The Bible says, you know, that didn't stop Jesus from bearing his cross. They didn't stop him from moving forward and doing what he needed to do, keeping his eyes where they belong and doing what needed to be done. It says there in Hebrews chapter 12, <coughs> in verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him did what? Endured the cross. Endured the cross. And what else did he do? despising the shame. There was a lot of shame that came with bearing that cross. It wasn't just the physical torture that he had to suffer. It was the mockery. It was the shame of being hung on that cross. That was, not a, a, that was a public shaming that he endured. But that, he didn't let that distract him from the goal. And we know that's the same way in our Christian life. We need to keep our eyes forward and, and look at where we need to go and not get distracted by the crowd around us. Whether it's the world trying to allure you uh, to the riches of this world, to the, to, to the, uh, you know, the pleasures of this life that the Bible, that Jesus said would choke the word, that it would become unfruitful. Don't let those things creep in. Don't look at that. Don't let that distract you. But also, don't let the naysayers, don't let those that are going to jeer and mock and scorn and ridicule distract you. You know, I saw a perfect example of this on the reservation this last weekend. We were knocking on this door. Uh, I mean, the place was, was, was very poor. It was mainly, there was no siding, just all raw OSB. Several children living in this home. Uh, there was, they didn't even have plumbing, I don't think. They were using an outhouse. It was, it was very, uh, you know, of course, people always have it worse. You know, and there was a time everybody lived like that. But you'd think in the modern day America, you wouldn't be living in such poor conditions, but these people were. And of course, grandma came out with uh, the two guys were trying to give the gospel, and grandma came out and started yelling, chasing them off. So uh, I mean, ran the kids off. She didn't see the one guy around the corner. So me and the other guy did like the real s slow, like we're, okay, we're leaving, but we weren't really. <laughs> so, but then sure enough, these two other young guys showed up in the car, and uh, the other grandsons. And they were older, probably in their twenties. And uh, the one, one of the soul winners, he goes over and he starts to talk to the one in the car, and he says. Uh, and, the, and the guy in the back seat says, well, I'm a child of the devil. Just says that to him. Well, I'm, I'm the devil's son. And he's saying in a mocking way, he was a, he was a punk. And, uh, his, but his buddy had gotten out of the car, so he goes over to him. And this guy starts listening. This guy starts to listen, and he, this guy eventually got saved. But the whole time that you know, so-called son of the devil, whether he was or not, he was self-proclaimed, had gotten out of the car after about five, ten minutes, because he was getting tired of waiting around, and was standing there just making, oh, mocking things, telling the other kids, don't listen to this guy. Being a total mocker, being a sitting in the seat of the scornful, a scorner. Now, what if that guy hadn't kept his eyes where they needed to be on the word of God, listening to the word of God being preached? And what if he just let that guy distract him? He wouldn't have been saved today. He would have walked away unsaved. And who knows what would have happened after that. Maybe he would have never gotten saved again. And it's the same, you know, that, of course, would... Uh, apply to his particular case but even for ourselves we can get distracted the christian life we can stop running the race as well as we should if we start you know we get off course we start running in the wrong lane we start you know you're trying to run the race and you see the guy selling popcorn in the stands and you think oh i'd like some of that you know i'm a little parched right now maybe go get a coke and sit down and take a break well you know that you can go ahead and do that but you're not going to finish well you're not going to place where you should you're not going to get everything done that you need to get done. <clears throat> so we need to run with our eyes forward. Why? So we don't get distracted. We don't get distracted by the others that are around us. We don't get distracted by the things of the world. We don't get distracted by the things in our past. And we need to run with our eyes focused or our eyes forward because that's what's going to keep us focused on what lies ahead. It's not just enough, it's not just so that we don't get distracted, it's so we can see the obstacles that are coming and trip over them and fall. Turn over to uh, Psalms 119 and we'll end here. Psalm 119. We need to keep our eyes forward. Now, how do you do this practically speaking? What would, 
you know, what would be something that you could actually do to help you keep your eyes forward? You know, well, one would be reading your Bible. You know, read your Bible. Get in the Bible every day and read it. See what it says and then practice it. Then put these things into practice. Come to church, listen to preaching the Word of God and then start to practice it. You know, putting, that's the practical application of this sermon. It's not just a literal keeping your eyes forward. Don't, don't walk out of here like a, some kind of an owl where you've got to turn your whole head you know, <laughs> to see what's going around. <laughs> Keep your eyes forward. You know, spiritually speaking, means to stay focused on the things that you need to be doing as a Christian. These fundamentals of the Christian faith. Bible reading, prayer, soul winning, church attendance. These are the things that make or break people in the Christian life. And it's when these things start, these basic simple things that start to slip, that's when people start to veer off course. Where they start to fall back in the race. Where they start to run a little less. Maybe they, maybe they slow down to a jog. And you know what? Sometimes in Christian life, we need to slow down a little bit. Maybe we've been pushing a little too hard. Maybe we need to just ease up. Say, man, I, you know, I've been reading you know, 20 pages a day. It's a little intense. You know, but here's the thing. Don't quit. If you're getting burned out, don't quit reading. Just read 10. Maybe just back up a little bit. Pace yourself. Run with patience. Well, in 10 gets to be too hard. Well, how about you read 5? You know what? And if life gets so crazy and hectic and busy as it can for some of us, where you don't even think you can fit that much time in, maybe just read a proverb. I would make that a permanent practice, but you know, some, sometimes in life, that's what we need to do is just run that race with patience. But we don't want to burn out, but we also don't want to just backslide to the place where we're not even running anymore. The Bible says, and you're there in Psalm 119, look at verse 105. <clears throat> the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What's going to illuminate the path in front of you? It's God's word. How are you going to keep your eyes focused? How are you going to keep your eyes forward in the direction that you're headed? It's by getting in the word. By allowing this to illuminate and guide you where you need to go. To show you where the path goes. And... <clears throat> Each step of our Christian life has to be taken in the light of Scripture. Each step of your life has to be taken in the light of Scripture. God shows us the goal. God shows us, hey, this is the finish line, being conformed to the image of Christ. And we should keep our eyes there. That's where we're headed. That's our reference point. But along the way, you know, God illuminates the path one step at a time. Salvation, baptism, these are just steps that we take. Bible reading, soul winning, church, these are just steps that we're taking along the path. <clears throat> and God lights those steps one step at a time. You see, so often in life, and this is something I remember being told early on, I've always thought about it, is that we want everything lit up the whole way. We want to know exactly where every twist and turn is, every obstacle, but it doesn't work like that. That's not life. And we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago, that life comes at you unexpe unexpectedly. It throws curveballs at us, doesn't it? And we want to know every pitch that's coming before the pitcher ever throws it. But that wouldn't be a fair game. And that's not how life works. And God lights the path one step at a time through his word. So, you know, whether we find ourselves, you know, we, we run this race, you know, and there's different types of races, aren't there? There's races that might be, you know, a nice scenic straightaway. You know, we, we, we just run along some beautiful lakeshore in life, so to speak, where everything's nice and flat and smooth. You know, that, that the course might have several different phases. Maybe that's where you're at. Everything's pretty smooth sailing right now. But you keep your eyes forward because there might be an obstacle course. You know, you could en end up in one of those, you know, weekend warrior events where you got to climb over the, the log poles and through the mud pits and through the little tunnels and do the rope swing. And, you know, every I've never done one. So, <laughs> you know, all those things that they, they have in those obstacle courses. Keep your eyes forward. You might, you might go from that nice scenic straightaway to you know, an obstacle course in your life. <coughs> and you've got to keep your eyes forward to finish this race. Because if if we are going to finish it, like I said, you're going to finish it one way or another. Whether It's just a question of whether or not you're going to go get drug across kicking and screaming or whether or not you're going to finish your course with joy. How are you going to do that? By keeping your eyes forward, by not getting distracted by the things around you, not getting distracted by the things that are behind you, by keeping your eyes forward and focused on the way in which God is leading you. Let's go ahead and pray.